Okay, so welcome to what is roughly the 115th in our series of webinars that we've been running since uh, late 2020 to talk about carbon 13 and explain how we help people who want to found climate tech startups, uh, high impact climate tech startups, uh, achieve that and magnify their personal impact on the climate crisis. I am Chris Coleridge. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the Business School in the University of Cambridge, Cambridge Judge Business School, and I'm also the founder and CEO of Carbon13. Uh, and uh, I personally came to the realization that I was going to spend the rest of my working life on climate change uh, back in 2019, uh, and it's been a fantastic ride since then. Um, I co-founded Carbon13 uh, with three co-founders, uh, one of whom is Nikki D. She's a, uh, a long-standing sustainability person, not someone who's come in because of Greta Thunberg like me. Um, she's been working in sustainability and the intersection with technology and entrepreneurship for over 20 years. And she's a fellow at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Uh, my third co-founder is Michael Languth, who is a, uh, a, an experienced entrepreneur um, and, and had a very successful startup, which he recently exited after Series B. Uh, and uh, then our fourth co-founder is a chap named Frank Knowles, uh, who was our CFO. Sadly, he passed away about 18 months ago, uh, suddenly, and he, uh, but strangely, but it's not that strange because it's Cambridge. His replacement as CFO is a friend of his, Jonathan, uh, who's a very experienced CFO, both in entrepreneurial growth companies uh, and, in, uh, in, and in large companies. So that's the four of us. We're a team of 20 now, um, and uh, we, we continue to grow. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we've done so far, but uh, the best is yet to come. Um, and we, we hope that potentially we'll be working with some of you uh, on our next cohort, cohort five. So climate change to us is a three-part problem. Um, we think of it as an overflowing bathtub. We've been pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at an unsustainable rate for far too long. Uh, and we've only just woken up to the fact that the, that the, metaphorically the bathtub is overflowing. Unfortunately, we're not immediately reaching for the tap and turning the tap off. Uh, we're turning it off at a roughly two to three percent a year. Um, that the net zero challenge is the challenge of turning the tap off and stopping ourselves from putting any more greenhouse gas into the into the atmosphere. Um, the second challenge is the carbon capture challenge. It would be very nice if we had a bucket. Uh, to lift some of this uh, greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere and stop the, the overflowing effect, which is causing a lot of structural damage. Uh, and those two problems, the net zero challenge of turning off the tap and the uh, carbon capture challenge of removing some of the greenhouse gas that's already there, those are the two areas that Carbon 13 works in. There is a third problem in the climate change space, which is how do we stop the house from falling down from all the structural damage that's being done by this overflow? Um, but this is not uh, this is not a, a carbon thirteen problem at the moment, uh, although we are looking at it and thinking about it for next year. Um, now, uh, we talk a lot in carbon thirteen about diversity. Uh, that is both because we're an organization like every other organization on the planet that should be playing its part. Uh, to address some of the structural inequalities that are out there, right, both in terms of gender and in terms of race. But uh, we talk about diversity really in a much more fundamental way, if you like, uh, because only by bringing diverse perspectives together will we actually uh, reach breakthrough innovations, right? I've been studying innovation uh, for 20 years, and I can tell you that uh, breakthrough innovations are brought about by diverse skill sets, diverse mindsets, diverse people coming around the table. Um, and on a very simple level, if you don't, if you like, if you don't like the way I'm talking, if you think it's a little bit high, uh, you know, high theory, uh, and, and you know, what about the practicality? I'll say I've met a lot of engineers over the last three years who think that climate change is an engineering problem. And I've met a lot of social impact people who think it's a behavioral change problem. Well, it's both. And we need those two groups of people to talk to each other, right? That's the, that's the very simple practical way. Uh, 
but but we very actively cultivate what I call. Hear me. That's I somehow must have activated my 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 Siri on my phone. Um, yeah, I lost the thread a little bit there, but I'll just go on to the next slide. Um, I have been teaching entrepreneurship for a long time, nearly twenty years now, and uh, I. Uh, I've seen a lot of bad accelerators. Um, and there are two main causes of bad accelerators, I think. One is uh, some accelerators just don't have very much in the way of resources, right? Uh, and so when we decided to found Carbon 13, we added an extra year to our journey of setting it up by saying, well, we're not gonna set up a, 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 an inferior version we're going to go out and raise money from corporates that is going to enable us to offer something really superior, right? Um, and uh, the uh, the you know that's enabled us to bring together a really amazing team, some extraordinary entrepreneurs in residence, uh, a great team of carbon experts in residence, and a team that is you know, bringing a thick layer of value add. To what we're doing, it's not a, it's not a one man and his dog operation. It is a uh, a, a pretty serious uh, operation that's really able to help on the commercial side, help on the scientific side, help on the carbon side, uh, help on every dimension of building ventures. Right. Part of our logic is, you know, this is a climate emergency. Uh, entrepreneurship is an inherently wasteful way of doing innovation. Right. Some too many innovations fail. Uh, and we don't actually have so much time to allow innovations to fail. So part of our logic is that we're de-risking the projects that we work with. Uh, we made eight investments in our first cohort, and all eight of those companies are still going. Seven have raised more finance than the investment we made. Uh, four of those teams, those seven teams, have raised further finance. Uh, you know, the, these are these projects. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not so arrogant to claim we're going to have 100% success rate, right? But these projects are making progress at a rate that is very, uh, is, is, is enhanced. It's definitely de-risked and enhanced compared to uh, normal startup life, right? Um, one of the things we focus on quite deeply is what we call carbon intelligence. Uh, we don't want our ventures to be like the most of the world, looking at carbon emissions through a risk and compliance lens. We want our ventures to have everybody in the top team, all the founders in the top team, able to understand carbon, able to understand what they are doing, what it's all about, uh, so that they can drive their business decisions to maximize their decarbonization. And the great thing is, from a from a sort of, you know, Obviously, we're facing a desperate situation, which is existential for the human race. So it sounds bad to say, well, there's a, there's a really nice thing here. But there is a really nice thing here, which is that at the moment, there is no trade-off between financial success in building a business and carbon impact. Right? Because the world, and I'll say more about this shortly, the world is crying out for solutions that actually have real decarbonization potential. And that, in a way, is how you could summarize what Carbon 30 does is, you know, we help our founders work from first principles to build things that actually have decarbonization potential so that they're not following just like, OK, what do the VCs want to see this month? Uh, what What is the big bubble that's going on at the moment? But they're actually saying, OK, uh, if we build something that has the potential to really make a difference, then the money will follow because that is the current environment that we're in. Back in 2019, when I and the team were whiteboarding Carbon 13, we said success looked like having 1,000 entrepreneurs through the program by the end of 2024, 200 ventures launched, uh, and being on track to have a 400 million ton CO2 equivalent uh, per annum impact on emissions. That's about 1% of world emissions. Um, I'm really happy to say that we're on track to do something like 270 ventures by the end of 2024. Uh, and 
uh, you know, our, our growth trajectory is, you know, partly because of the success we've achieved with our early cohorts is, is more, is steeper than we, we thought it would be. Um, our call to each of you is to come and work on a venture that has the potential to, to take 10 million tons CO2 equivalent emissions out of the emissions base, right? And the idea is that, you know, across our portfolio of startups, enough will succeed in that ambition to be able to have a 400 million ton impact. Uh, we're trying to build uh, game changers, right? 10 million tons is a lot of carbon, right? So it's not, you know, the Americans these days are talking about half a gigaton of carbon, 500 million tons of carbon. That's, that's so much carbon that you're actually narrowing the scope of different projects you could work on to a few dozen, right? Uh, 10 million tons of carbon is a lot of carbon. It's an impactful, significant amount of carbon, but it is something where there are many thousands of targets uh, that you, projects that you could work on that could potentially have that impact. Um, so that you know, this is our this is our plan. In the last few years, what's moved on in the climate change space? It's certainly not that you know the emissions have meaningfully have started to reduce really fast. What's moved on? to the extent that you can call this moving on is the rise of the net zero pledge. There are now over 3000 organizations that have signed up to the science-based targets, which are sort of the, the beginning steps on the, on the journey to, uh, to, a, to a net zero pledge. Um, we talk to a lot of corporates and our startups talk to a lot of corporates who have drawn up their net zero plans. And really they're quite desperate to, you know, put some substance around those plans, right? They, you know, even the most forward looking companies, the Ikeas or Unilevers of this world, there is a lot of white space in their plan for how they're gonna to get to net zero, right? They need, and they welcome, and we, you know, I used to talk about this back before we actually started. Uh, I used to talk about this in theory, but now we see it in practice every day that those corporates are looking for projects that have the potential to actually help them decarbonize and they welcome in those people. And this is one of the things that you need for entrepreneurship. You need uh, people who are uh, looking for, they recognize that they have a problem, but they haven't worked out how to solve it yet. Now, we're also interested in consumer. Um, of the 32 investments we've made so far, three have been in the consumer space. Um, but we think, you know, if you live in Northern Europe, it's easy to get carried away with the idea that everyone accepts climate change. Everyone knows it's a problem. Everyone's worried about it. Well, there are big parts of the world where not so many, it's not so much the case, right? Where, uh, you know, if you're, if you live in the U S uh, you know, there's a lot of people who don't really accept that it's, you know, that this is a, a real problem. Um, if, you, and in lots of parts of the world, you know, people just don't have it in their top five list of things that, to worry about. It's only in Northern Europe that you really get that phenomenon uh so strongly uh or in fact of course if you live in 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 a part of the world that's going to be directly affected uh by the floods and the droughts and the fires and so on um now this is a you know a, a slide that's a little bit pro forma because it's telling you uh something that we understand very well which is the the financial world uh is waking up to the potential here right you could think of climate change like a war, right? What happens in a war? In a war, a lot of money gets thrown at a problem very quickly. Uh, and a lot of people make profits uh, from, uh, from how incredibly rapidly the transition happens, right? Uh, and so investors are very much waking up to this and saying, okay, well, we see, we see some real interesting opportunities there. Um, and investment in climate tech continues to grow even while the overall venture capital world is actually in a little bit of a, of a disrupted state at the moment. Larry Fink of BlackRock said, the next 1000 unicorns, meaning $1 billion capitalization businesses are going to come from the green transition, right? Not from, uh, you know, not from more software. Well, some of those green transition businesses will be software, uh, but not from more internet rollout companies. Um, and it's an interesting phenomenon that's going on, right? In the same way that corporates are saying, okay, we've got a problem. We don't know how to solve it. Who's going to help us solve it? 
uh, venture capital is an industry, right? Venture capital is, and they're trying to work out, okay, so how do we flex our model so that we have the maximum impact on climate change, right? Not from a self, you know, from a, a, a an altruistic point of view, but from a okay, there's going to be a lot of money made from this transition. How do we position ourselves to 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 be part of that? Uh, and so we see more unicorns in the clean tech space uh, every every year, and we see uh, the number of seed stage deals. So that's the sort of one to five million dollar type of deal that the companies that come out of carbon 13 are raising after our little investment that we make, our pre-seed investment that we make, the number of those deals is going up very rapidly as well. Now, this the headline of this slide that you're looking at was written by my co-founder, Nikki, because Nikki is a, a, a sustainability veteran. And so Nikki talks about the 1.5 degree warming target, right? And the 1.5 degree warming target is something that I think we all can understand is not going to be hit. Right. We just there is just no chance that we're going to decarbonize by 26 gigatons between now and the end of 2030. Right. Uh, so we are going to overshoot that 1.5 degree warming target. Uh, I see people talking about 2.7 degrees. I see people talking about three degrees. I see people talking about four degrees. And really, the, this, this level of heating, if you think about the disruption that's currently being caused by about one degree of heating, compared to the baseline uh, uh, the, the baseline norms of, of past decades, um, you know, three degrees of heating is going to put the world's food system under possibly in stress that can't be handled, right? Um, so our investments are in ventures that have the potential to mitigate 10 million tons. Uh, we, we give you a greenhouse gas, gas toolkit that you use with the help of our carbon experts to work out you know, what is your pathway to having this 10 million tons impact. And we provide some shared services like carbon accounting packages uh, that allow you to, to track your carbon impact over time. Um, how do we do it? Okay, we've talked enough about the why and the, the sort of what's, you know, what's, the, what's the context. How do we do it? We bring together twice a year in Cambridge and starting in 2023, twice a year in Berlin, uh, cohorts of founders who want to found climate tech businesses, right? And that, so I'll tell you about cohort four. Cohort four is 104 founders. Uh, there, there were 30 scientists, uh, roughly 25, a little bit less than 25 software founders, and the rest were commercial founders. Right? So people either with a lot of commercial experience, including an, a large number of startup found, startup people who previously founded startups, some of them successfully uh, exited startups, and what we call our venture catalyst founders, which are commercial founders who are a little bit less experienced, right? So people typically who have some amazing startup skill set, uh, some, uh, some um, uh, social capital in an industry uh, that you know is really important to decarbonization. So they're going to be able to help the team that they they are are part of to make good connections to to that industry. Uh, and then also people who have really strong sustainability backgrounds also often fit into our venture catalyst category. We bring those people together. Now these photos are photos of people in person together. Of course, that's you know that's only part of the picture. Uh, in our program, there are a total of nine days of in-person attendance that's required. There are four more days in the middle where there's optional in-person attendance. And there are two days at the end where it's mandatory in-person attendance. But of course, that only the mandatory at the end only applies to the companies that we've actually invested in. We brought together an amazing uh, uh, Community, I suppose, is, is the way I'm going to put it. Um, we have, uh, so far through our program, we've taken nearly 300 founders, um, a quarter of them from Oxbridge, a quarter of them with PhDs, a quarter women. Uh, we'd like it to be more of, of, of each of those, but that's, you know, that's, that's where it is. Most of them have startup experience of some kind, just over half. 
We have an amazing network of domain experts. These numbers here are a little bit out of date. We've actually got uh, 230 domain experts now. Uh, we're, we now have 10 experts in residence um, and they are working with our, Cambridge, our, our carbon expert in residence. So it's really all you know, a, about bringing together such a collection of amazing people that we're able to really support the founders on their journey. It takes a village to build a startup. The timeline looks like this. Uh, we start by selecting candidates for cohort four. We got just under a thousand applications and a uh, hundred of those started our program. Over a six week period, those people are teaming up uh, in cohort four, just about, we're just at the stage where 80 people from those 104 have teamed up with others and they've gone through to the second stage of the program, which is the validation stage. During that three months, uh, those those people are uh, putting flesh on the bones of their ideas. They're coming up with, you know, ways that um, you know we they they can uh, you know they they can get proof points from customers, figure out kind of you know what does the demand landscape look like, what is the what is the product going to look like, and so on. At the end of that three months, they pitch uh, for an investment. Um, in cohort four, we're actually aiming to make fourteen investments, not twelve. Uh, then once we've invested, there's another three months uh, where you're really building traction and uh, trying to uh, make commercial progress, which is the key to raising more money. Right? Uh, we are making at the investment stage, we're making an eighty thousand pound investment. And that's in return for somewhere between five and a half percent and twelve and a half percent of your equity. Now, of the twenty companies that were, went through our first two cohorts, uh, sixteen of those have raised more money, and the one those sixteen, the ones that raised more money, uh, we've taken roughly about six percent of their equity. Uh, it, it varies a bit depending on how much the the uh, the the, the team raises as their next round. Only in the 20% of cases where they haven't raised again, do we end up with about 12% of the equity. So this is a very, very founder friendly approach, right? There are plenty of venture builders out there that take 30% of the equity. Uh, it's quite standard in this kind of talent first venture builder to take 10% of the equity. For those com companies that are actually succeeding, we're taking and, and going fast, we're taking about 6%. And that's deliberate, right? We, we're an impact-driven, vision-driven, uh, mission-driven organization. You know, yes, just, you know, the, the nature of this space is if we succeed in decarbonizing, then the investors are going to make a lot of money and we are going to make a lot of money, right? But this is, this is, a, this is not a kind of a choice, right? This is a, if you wanna have the decarbonization potential, then you have to scale. If you're going to scale, you have to raise a lot of capital. If you successfully scale, then the people who put that capital in are going to make a lot of money, right? So this is not a moral, get, you know, this is not a moral dilemma where it's like either make money or do good. This is a, in order to have this decarbonization impact, a lot of money has to be made for the investors. Right? So, you know, our, our five and a half, six percent of, of, of equity is designed to be attractive to the best founders in the world. Right. Uh, cohort five starts in Cambridge on the 14th of March. Uh, so uh, that's 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 where you know this is roughly what it's going to look like. Um, I have forgotten to put in the extra slide about Berlin. So cohort one in Berlin starts on the 21st of February. Right. Now, how do you choose between the two? If you're to participate in the Berlin Venture Builder, you need to be able to work in the EU, right? So anybody who's got who's got the right to work in the EU, we would nudge you. I mean, it's up to you. You can come to Cambridge if you prefer, uh, but we would nudge you in the direction of the of the Berlin Venture Builder. If you're coming from anywhere else in the world, including the UK, of course, uh, then uh, we would we would suggest that maybe Cambridge is the is is the right place to start. Uh, but obviously, this is something that if you apply for the program, we can discuss when we interview you. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just reaching the point where we have more competitors. Uh, Entrepreneur First is a talent first accelerator. They recently 
announce that they're going to get into the climate game. Um, but I'm afraid they do think of it as a game. And there is a certain, um, you know, this is the hot area in entrepreneurship. Uh, let's take advantage of it, as opposed to bringing together hundreds of people who really, uh, yeah, are amazingly skilled and are bringing, you know, great talent to the to the to the table, but who are aligned around this goal of 10 million tons CO2 equivalent emissions. Um, also, entrepreneur first take 10% of the equity, not the sort of 6% uh, that we take. Antler also does some climate tech work, but again, they're but like entrepreneur first, they're very generalist. They're not specializing. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's about you know this is the latest wave from uh, from VCs, so we'd better be involved in it as opposed to really the core of the existence, which is what we do. Uh, the Climate Kick is a very widespread program around Europe, but they don't make investments. Third Derivative is a good program in the US, but you need to be a little bit further down the pike than just uh, in terms of the progress of your team and and venture. Uh, then, then uh, in, in order to participate in that. Uh, and Zinc recently launched a cohort in, uh, in environment, but they are now going back to other areas of, uh, of, of social impact that are not to do with the climate. Um, I won't go through two slides on the same subject. Okay, here's our investment so far. We've made 32 investments so far. We'll make another 14 in January uh, in our cohort four. Uh, we're really delighted with how they've how they've come along. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single one on this slide. Um, uh, our cohort three investments, I will go through one by one just to give you a flavor for what we're doing. Six of these are hardware, six of these are software, right? And that's pretty much an informal po informal policy of ours is that we want to make roughly 50% hardware, 50% software uh, investments. Uh, it's not something we're going to, religiously hold ourselves to, but that is roughly our policy. Um, 17 Cicada has a process for making a potential substitute for PET, the kind of plastic uh, that this is made out of, uh, for uh, using bacteria. So a very low carbon uh, intensive process. It looks like one of the investors in their next round of investment after our, we've invested um, in um, earlier this year, uh, in August, uh, is going to come from Coca-Cola. So we're pleased about that. Um, Circular 11 is another plastic space business that's recycling plastic and turning it into construction materials. Uh, good, good carbon impact there because concrete and cement are major, major, major sources of emissions. Um, whereas taking plastic is eff effective and not burning it, for example, in an incinerator, but turning it into something else is a very carbon positive uh, move. Eleniti is working on a sensor that can detect the health of the soil biome. So the current method for agriculture is very destructive and we have about 40 years left of topsoil in the world. So the question of when are we gonna to move to regenerative agriculture is not meaning agriculture that replenishes the topsoil, doesn't deplete the topsoil. Is It's really not a question of, oh, wouldn't it be nice, like organic, like free range? It's inevitable. The, the current food system will not feed us. So we have to go to regenerative agriculture and we need enabling technologies like this sensor to be able to do that. Neom has a technology for low carbon emissions production of ammonia. Ammonia is a really fundamental material in the in industry, right? It's a major component of fertilizer and many, many, many other industrial processes. And so having a low carbon way of producing it would really make a massive impact. Mortar.io is a software startup in the built environment. They are helping property owners to find ways to uh, figure out what is the roadmap to decarbonizing their properties, right? So. They've got a, a, a London council as their first client, uh, and they've signed up a, a number of other players in the built environment, uh, and they're basically offering to help them run through their portfolio of tens of thousands of properties and figure out what is the best way to decarbonize each one of those. Open Hydro is, a, again, a software startup. This is a, a startup that is providing a platform that enables developers who are trying to develop hydropower projects to do that about 18 months more quickly 
than they could without the open hydro platform. This means a higher return on capital for those hydropower producers, right? Uh, uh, hydropower obviously is a very well established technology, um, but in the energy transition, we need many, many more hydropower projects uh, and not just the huge dams, we need smaller dams, right? We need smaller hydropower projects uh, as well if we're gonna complete the energy transition to net zero. Preoptima is a company that uh, the, the founder is a professor at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and uh, they are working to help move the, the, the process of identifying how buildings can be decarbonized to the earliest possible stage in the design process, right? So the status quo is architects design the building, they work up the plans, and then they think about, okay, how do we decarbonize? Uh, we need to be decarbonizing at a much earlier stage than that in the design process. Uh, Rescope is a software analytics startup that is helping work out how uh, investment managers can look at the climate risk in their startups, uh, not startups, in their portfolios. Uh, so investment managers in banks, in, in, you know, in investment banks uh, need to understand how much climate risk am I taking in my portfolio in order to be able to figure out, okay, you know, how can I benefit from this green transition that's going on? Uh, and so Rescope helps them, helps them do that. Sunbear Bioworks is using precision fermentation to come up with a substitute for palm oil. So palm oil is hugely implicated in, uh, in, in the, the climate crisis because uh, it's a really important ingredient in about 50% of food that you have in the supermarket. And uh, to get it, you have to cut down rainforest, right? So uh, it's, we need a substitute and we need it quickly. SunJewel is a little bit like Open Hydro. They're a software startup, uh, but they're helping uh, developers of agrovoltaics projects. So Open Hydro is helping hydropower projects. SunJewel is helping agrovoltaics projects to get off the ground. Agrovoltaics uh, represents an absolutely enormous uh, potential for more solar power because basically it's a way of putting solar panels onto farmland in a way that you can still grow crops on that farmland while also getting the solar uh, the solar power. Uh, and this is going to be an absolutely enormous part of the green energy transition because we need the we we we're running out of land or we're not running out of but we you know we we have a uh, we, we, we're, we're running out of land to build solar farms on. And so if we could build solar farms on farmland, that would really, uh, while still being able to grow crops, that would really help. The battery recycling company has some tech that can help take the current state of the art, uh, where if you recycle battery, you get about 70% of the material to be reusable, uh, up to 95%. Uh, and so that's obviously really important technology at the moment. Zoritex is again a software startup that is uh, working in the textile recycling industry to help textile recyclers figure out how to separate their waste streams of fabric uh, of textile in a more carbon friendly way so that they're recapturing the, 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 uh, the materials that are going to allow them to have a positive carbon impact in a more effective way than, in the, than the current approach does. Okay, I'm incredibly proud of, of these startups. Right, this is a this is an unbelievably great portfolio of uh, of, of of startups. Uh, Preoptima has already uh, got uh, an offer of investment uh, after our investment in August. I believe that the, all twelve of these have the potential uh, to go on and raise significant more sums, and more importantly, have uh, have a have a great impact. Right now, some of these founders, if you think about the ideas that I've just unrolled to you. Some of those founders came in with those ideas, right? But in our process, about half of the people who are working in these teams didn't come in with the idea. They came in and joined the team of somebody who had the idea, right? So it's you know it's a it's a very open process for both for people who have ideas. About two thirds of people come in with an idea, uh, and for people who don't have an idea, and of course many of those people who come in with an idea pretty early in the carbon thirteen process they drop their idea and switch to something. That to somebody else's idea that they think is better, right? Um, so of our 32 ventures, 18 are software, um, 14 are hardware, and in cohort three, we moved to 50-50, and I think we're gonna stay there. 
Cohort one, seven of the eight ventures have raised further funding, as I told you before. Cohort two, ah, this is out of date. It says six out of 12 have raised further funding. It's actually nine out of 12 now. Uh, of the 32 ventures, 18 have at least one female founder. Uh, two of the 32 teams are all female teams. Uh, 16 are mixed teams, male and female in the team, and the others are all male teams. Uh, in cohort one, we had four teams of two, three teams of three, one team of four. Cohort two, nine teams of two, three teams of three. Cohort three, it was mostly teams of three, as you see there. Um, and uh, yeah, very, you know, very interesting group. Okay, I'm going to pause now and see what questions you have. What's the role of, uh, say, software engineers at the early stage? Is it going to be a lot of writing prototypes or how is there, is there a lot of software to write? while yeah i mean it's a great question accelerate. so yeah you know typically the software founders you know a lot of what they're doing in the first let's say five months is supporting the commercial founder right because and you know and that includes by talking to customers and being involved in in you know in in the, in the building of the team if you like the the building of the bonding of the team uh, that's a very important part of the process but as your question implies until you have validated your assumptions about what the customer wants to buy, there's not a lot of software to write. You know, Now, a team that's made up of a commercial founder and a software founder is very investable, right? I mean, you know, obviously it depends on a lot of factors, but you know, just looking at the team aspect uh, is, is very investable because investors really like the idea that, okay, what we're buying when we invest is that you're on a journey together the commercial founders doing the selling, the software founders building the prototype and, and, and kind of taking it to, to proof of concept stage, right? Um, I mean, did I answer your question, Atif, or, or do you, did, were you asking something slightly different to what I've, what, what I've touched on there? So if I, if I understood correctly, you're saying there's not a lot of software to write, there's other support that the team needs. Yeah, but I mean, it's a classic thing where the team can't, you know, a team that's just a commercial founder that doesn't have a software founder will often, you know, you can have the, they can have the most brilliant pitch and the most awesome kind of connection to customers ever. But if they don't have a co-founder who's going to be able to help them actually build it, uh, then the pro progress they're about to, they're able to make is, is more limited. Now, of course, you know, this goes back to a question that, that I would, um, that I sometimes get asked, which is, you know, when you start Carbon 13, are you full time? And it's really variable, right? Some some people, and it's more common with the commercial founders and the venture catalysts, are all in from day one, right? Uh, but a lot of people, uh, especially the software founders, tend to be uh, still have some outside things that they're working on. Typically, software founders have some contracting that they're doing. Uh, you know, because in the early stages, a lot of the tasks that need to be done are what I call calendar time tasks, not clock time tasks. So <clears throat> it takes a while to get in people's diaries. It takes a while, you know, so you can have meetings with potential customers. It takes a while to go through the fundraising process, right? Um, so, you know, the, 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 the carbon 13 process for a lot of people is the beginning of a process of detachment when you raise not the carbon 13 money, but the next round of money, typically that's where the founder, uh, the founders need to be all in. Atif, go ahead. So if I were, if I were to take like a, a software job or, or something similar, like I'd have a technical interview, how yeah. is a non-technical founder to assess how good a potential like software founder might be for their company? Well, uh, so like is that where we often see comes in. Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're doing a lot of screening ourselves, right? And and trying to, you know, get get the get the people who we believe have the skills. You know, I don't don't claim that we're doing, you know, really deep background checks, right? But we are looking pretty carefully at people's backgrounds, and we're interviewing people a a, a couple of times. Um, a lot of what, I mean, the average age of our cohort, as you maybe, I, I didn't touch on it when it was on the slide, 
the average age of our cohort four is 38 and cohort one, two, and three, it was all 37. So we're getting in pretty experienced people who tend to have, you know, reasonable CVs with a reasonable track record. We do tend to see the commercial founders doing some due diligence and asking for references and so on, right? Um, uh, you know, to, to some extent, the um, uh, you know, the, it's up to the individual founders how much due diligence they want to do on their potential co-founder, right? It, it, and and we see some people who are very okay. I'm going to take a leap of faith with you, and we see other people who are much more kind of punctilious about the whole thing. I, am I helping? Are yes, you a commercial, are you a software guy yourself, Atif, or are you a commercial guy? I'm a software guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure how to take your question. No, I, <laughs> um, you know, one of the one of the interesting things that we see in the in the first phase is teams sorting themselves into you know partly by complementarity, right? That you need a software founder and a or you need a, a technical founder and a commercial founder. Often we're seeing with those teams of three that I mentioned, often it's a scientist, a data scientist or a software founder and a commercial founder team of three. Um, you know, people are sniffing each other, right? And they're and they're they're sort of looking into each other, you know, partly just in a sort of what's the chemistry like. Um, but also trying to understand, okay, you know, does this does this person seem like they will be able to walk the walk when the time comes. So yeah, inter very, very relevant, interesting question. Thank you. Um, Jan, go ahead. Hey, thanks so much for the, the entire presentation. Uh, quick question, you've mentioned carbon intelligence as part of kind of a, the educational piece uh, for yeah. people who doesn't necessarily come with the uh, climate background or the decarbonization background. Could you speak to that? Like, how does that uh, cope within the time frame yeah, I mean, or the, the overall timeline? So we run some workshops on carbon, but the but the core element is uh, your carbon expert in residence, right? Who's meeting with you across phase two to help you put your carbon case and your carbon pitch together, right? Because we need the team to tell us why, you know, why and how you think you can get potentially to 10 million tons, right? Um, but the goal of that of that carbon expert is to get you to the point where, or to get to the team to a point, that's the, the key, um, that you're going to be able to, um, to make a serious, uh, you know, a serious set of decisions around carbon, right? I mean, and we, it's been fascinating for us because we see teams assessing different routes to market. And, you know, we don't tell you, we, we're very, much advisors and facilitators, right? We're not saying, hey, this is our thesis about what you know you should be working on, right? Um, and we don't take corporate thesis, like a lot of a lot of accelerators, they turn to corporates and say, hey, corporates, tell us what uh, you know some problem statements are. But we don't we know, well, I know from my studies of innovation over the years, that is not how you get breakthrough innovations, right? Innovators, breakthrough innovators need to be working on stuff that's three to five years down the pike, not stuff that uh, not not stuff that the corporates are worried about uh, worried about right now. You know, I think I've completely diverged from your question. <laughs> I've completely digressed from the question that you were trying to ask me. Um, yeah. No, it's yeah. okay. I just I I try to understand. Basically, you've mentioned it's a part of phase two yeah. kind of yeah. thing as part of the EIRs that yeah, I mean, are supporting look, you in the the venture itself. That's right. I mean, look, we're not a. This is the closest we get to being a teaching program, right? And, you know, back in cohort one, we had quite a few people joining kind of on the basis that they wanted to understand more about climate change innovation. Um, nowadays, we don't. And that was a problem for us because it's kind of like, well, yeah, it's great if you understand more about it. But what we're interested in is, are you actually going to do it? Right. Um, now we don't have that problem so much because you can go to Terra.do or, you know, there are different programs out there to teach you right about about climate. Um, we generally find that people have done at least engage with drawdown.org and maybe John Doerr's books, Speed and Scale, uh, before they join. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, so our goal is to help to, is to teach you enough that carbon is going to be in the boardroom, not something of your of your venture once it grows, rather than something that you say, 
yeah, you know, we better hire some experts to kind of give us a thumbs up on this carbon stuff, right? Uh, we, we want you to understand enough that you are, uh, you're, and, and, you know, as I say, it's the current regulatory environment is, uh, and, and kind of corporate environment is such that, you know, making a carbon impactful decision is very, you know, is really in, indistinguishable from making a, uh, making a, a financially driven decision. Christine, you are next. Hi there. Can yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so I have uh kind of a more of a corporate background. Um, and I've had a lot of roles in strategy and marketing and program management. Um yep. and when you were mentioning that, you know, the majority of your class uh, or cohort does have startup experience, is it a non-starter if someone does not have that? No, I would so um fifty two percent have startup experience. the rest are are like you <laughs> coming from industry. Um, all right, thank you. yeah, I mean, uh, you know that's probably an exaggeration. Probably a, a quarter are coming from industry and a quarter are coming straight out of academic science. Um, but yeah, somebody who's somebody who's got uh, I, I mean, what industry do you work in, Christine? Healthcare. Yeah, okay. well, I was hoping you were going to say I work in energy or uh, <laughs> agriculture or something like that, right? So, but yeah, somebody who has got who has senior, you know, has the credibility basically to be the CEO of the venture, um, and that describes, you know, I said eighteen of our thirty-two ventures have um, female co-founders in the mix. Of those eighteen, I guess. 15 have a female CEO, certainly it's more than 12. Um, so that that's a combination that's worked very well for Carbon 13. Let's put it that way. Okay, okay somebody, somebody else had their hand raised and has put it down again. Maybe they wanted to ask me the same question that Christine asked me. No, um, it was me. I was just going to ask a question about the um, venture launch pad that was announced. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Okay. So yes, we are launching a new program, which is aimed at pre-existing teams. Are you a pre-existing team? Yeah, I do have a co-founder already. So, okay. so keep an eye on the website, subscribe to our newsletter, and you will get an announcement when applications open in the next probably two weeks. Amazing. Awesome. Thanks. No problem. Um, yeah, I mean, and that does mean, you know, historically, we've always taken a few pre-existing teams into each cohort in the Venture Builder. But with the launch of the Venture Launchpad, we will now have a much more clear divide between pre-existing teams go over there in the Venture Launchpad, sole founders go in the go in, go in the Venture Builder. Now, there is still be a little bit of crossover, both in the sense that sometimes pre, you know, if I look at our pre-existing teams that have been through cohorts one to four or one to three, um, they've often picked up a third co-founder. And in fact, you know, our most successful team in terms of, not yet in terms of carbon impact, but in terms of money raised, uh, was two, two technical blokes joining as a pre-existing team. And they picked up Natalia as their, uh, as their CEO. And honestly, they just could not have made a better match. <laughs> she has just really driven them to, to heights and they've recently, uh, raised a big round at a 20 million valuation. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, um, that's still, you know, that kind of, that question for the venture launchpad teams, the pre-existing teams, are you still looking for a co-founder is going to continue to be something that we, uh, that we, we, we facilitate those matches, but sometimes teams say, nope, not looking for a co-founder. Uh, we feel that we've got the, we've got the right balance of skills in the team as it is. And that's, you know, that's who the Venture Launchpad is aimed at. Um, very good. More questions? Go ahead, Ananda. Uh, hi. In one of the categories of entrepreneurs, uh, you had mentioned that they need to have a lot of social capital in the area of their uh, work. Uh, does it have to be necessarily in the same geography as well, or do you help in building up that social capital as well? Well, so, okay, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. 
we we have invested in companies that are operating outside the UK. Um, and it, I mean, obviously, the the ambition of you, okay. First thing to say is you couldn't have a 10 million ton impact and just be in one one national market. Like, may, okay, maybe in India or China, but otherwise, you, you know, you're really, or Indonesia, maybe, you're, you're really, uh, if you're starting in the UK, in order to have a 10 million ton impact, you're going to have to be international, right? So that's one thing to say is that we're, all of our startups, we are nudging them, pushing them in the direction of, well, you're going to have to be international at some point. So what is your roadmap to, to becoming international? Second thing to say is we have invested in some teams that are operating outside the UK. So Tierra Foods from cohort one is doing agroforestry in Guatemala uh, and southern Mexico, and they are harvesting rainforest ingredients, if you want to call them that, uh, which can then be injected into the food system in the US. So nice, you know, it's a good business. We really like it. Um, uh, off-grid finance, also a cohort one venture, is uh, primarily operating in Kenya. Um, and they will then, as soon as they have built up enough momentum in Kenya, their second market is India. Um, oh, let me go back to the, sli to the slide to remind myself of some other ventures um, that are operating internationally. Oh, well, uh, Agreed. Uh, is a, an ag tech venture that is operating in uh, in simultaneously in the US and the UK. Um, Sunbear is in the Netherlands and the UK. Shanti is in Mexico City and Chicago. So you know we do we do uh, invest in businesses that are outside the UK. I think now, firstly, on your question to your question, you don't have to have a lot of social capital. It's just helpful. Right. You know, that that would be that that would be one of the plus points that we would look for in an application where, you know, if you're well connected in the food system, if you're well connected in transport, if you're well connected in energy, um, then, you know, these are these are great. You know, that's that's really going to help your application. Um, typically, we would say, you know, look, your network is your network. We're not, of course, we are going to introduce you to our domain experts. We're going to introduce you to our, to our, to our various types of mentors, our entrepreneurs, residents, and so on. Um, and that's going to help build up your social capital. But, you know, we're interested in the network that you're bringing to the table as well, right? So if you're, I, I don't know, have I touched on, the, on, on the, what you're really trying to ask me, Ananda? Yes, yes, you have. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Okay. Any, we are out of time, so I probably will wind up, but I could take one last question. Okay. Great to meet you all and um, feel free to go over to the website and apply as soon as possible. And uh, we, uh, uh, you know, thank you for your engagement with Carbon 13's mission. Take care.